Apostle John, the Word of God said, the Apostle whom Jesus loved doesn't mean he hated the others, it just meant he had a unique relationship with John. Received a revelation while he was on the Isle of Patmos. He had been sent there in exile, and it was not a pretty place, it was not a pleasant place, it was a difficult place. And yet, in the midst of a very difficult circumstance, as God so often does, the Lord came through in a mighty powerful way and gave John a vision uh, of the future, showed him many things that were to come to pass, and he revealed himself to John as the Almighty God. Hallelujah. And today I want to talk to us on the topic, God from A to Z. Hallelujah. God from A to Z. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. I'll put it on the screen for you. Amen. And the Word of God today reads from the King James text. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh all things, excuse me, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Isn't that one of the most wonderful <coughs> portions of Scripture that you could ever read? I remember years ago, uh, I was asked to go to the bedside of an old man that I did not know, but he was related to a cousin of mine. And uh, she asked if I would go with her, and he was on his way home. He was soon to leave this life. And I brought my Bible, as was the custom, as is my custom, when I go to visit people in the hospital. And I opened it to Revelation 21, and I read this portion of Scripture, and tears just flowed down his face as he heard the promise of God that one day all tears would be wiped away, there'd be no more pain, there'd be no more crying, there'd be no more death, there'd be no more sickness. Oh, I'm telling you folks, I don't know about you, but I appreciate that promise, don't you? Amen. Amen. A lot of people are afraid of the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation has a lot of great stuff in it. This is some pretty good stuff. Today I want to talk to us on the topic, God from A to Z. If you'll bow your heads with me just one quick moment. Father, once again, God, we come before you at this hour. The Word of God is now open, and the preacher stands in the pulpit, humbling himself before you, hoping, Lord, that today 
You will use me in a wonderful way to bless the people of God with truth. The Word of God said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Master, we don't need man-made doctrine. We don't need dogma. We need today to hear a word from heaven. We need our God to speak to our hearts, to minister to our spirits. And Lord, you do this by reason of your word, the word of God declaring. He sent his word and healed them. Use me today, O oh God, as your tool. Use me as your oracle. Allow the precious wonderful, glorious news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to flow from me like water, Master, today. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I don't want there to be any confusion as to who is speaking in Revelation 21, 1 through 7. We see that the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And then in verse 3, the word of the Lord declares, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And we continue through the promises and it says in verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne, doesn't say they that sat upon the throne, it says he, that is singular, that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. In other words, you can take this to the bank. And he said unto me, it is done. You remember on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. That is because the work that he had come to do involving the cross was finished. He had accomplished his task. He here says in the book of Revelation, it is done. That means it has fully culminated everything, not just my earthly mission, but now Everything is done that I had intended to do. I've redeemed the church. I've raptured my people. Uh, the earth has stood in judgment. Everything is done. There's nothing left now undone. Now I will be a God to my people and they will be sons to me. It's done. Hallelujah. But lest there be any confusion as to who it is that sat upon the throne and spoke these words, let's look back at Revelation chapter 1 verses 8 through 18. In this passage, the Word of God declares, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which was, excuse me, which is and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man. In other words, someone appearing like a human. One like to the Son of Man. Who did they call the Son of Man? Jesus. He continues, clothed with a garment down to the foot, 
and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. We're hearing the same declaration three times in Revelation 1. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you recall in Revelation 21, we read in verse number 6, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is speaking? The same person has to be speaking because you can't have two Alphas and two Omegas. He said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who's talking? Jesus is talking. Hallelujah. This is the Lord. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 16, listen, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Who does the word of God say is going to come and reward every man according to his works? Jesus. That's what the word of God tells us. In verse 13, listen, Revelation 22. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, I think that clears up, doesn't it? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Hallelujah. We read that in Revelation 1, we read how that he said, I am he which uh, was alive and was dead. Obviously, he is not speaking as God, as it were, but he's speaking as the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I telling the truth? We know who was talking because Jesus is the one who, who died and is alive again forevermore. And in Revelation 22, he makes it abundantly clear. The same one, once again, who declares, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then in verse 16, uh, 16 he said I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches hallelujah so Jesus throughout the book of revelation Jesus Christ of Nazareth declares I am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end what in the world does he mean when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega? The Alpha and Omega are two letters found in the Greek alphabet. Alpha is the first letter, and Omega is the last letter. If we translate that into English, it would be saying, I am the A to Z. Hallelujah. Do you get it? Do you understand it a little better? He says, I am the A to Z. Hallelujah. I'm the beginning of the alphabet, and I'm the end of the alphabet. Glory to God. In the Word of God, Matthew 16, 27, we have confirmation that Jesus is speaking in Revelation 22 as the word of God declares for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he shall reward every man 
according to his works. So in Revelation 22 it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So we know for a fact we're talking about Jesus. The declaration, I am the Alpha and the Omega, came from the Lord Jesus Christ. There can be no doubt. There can be no question. This matter is settled. The Word of God has made it abundantly clear. When we read in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We are hearing from the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, we heard similar words in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 41 and verse 4, the Word of God declares, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am He. In Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, the Word of God declares, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, or even His Redeemer. Whose Redeemer? Israel's Redeemer. The Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Hallelujah. And who as I shall call and shall declare it, and set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear not, be neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Okay, Pastor, what are you trying to tell us? What I'm trying to tell you today is in the Old Testament through the prophet Isaiah, God declares, Jehovah God declares, I am the first and I am the last. Hallelujah. In the book of Revelation, we see Jesus over and over again making the declaration, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Hallelujah. The beginning and the end. Honey, I got news for you. The God of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. Hallelujah. Yeah. To the Lamb of God. The key word in all of these declarations that we're reading today is the word beginning. The Lord declares, I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. What does he mean when he says, I am the beginning? Well, listen, it's really quite easy. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 declares, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning, God. You see, the Jewish faith, and by extension the Christian faith, is rather unique from many faiths that are in the world because there are many faiths, many religions in our world today that claim gods who had an origin. Their god had a beginning. Their god had a start. Our god is without beginning. In the beginning, he was there. He, he, was, he didn't have to come into being. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's why the book of Genesis is very unique. If you look at Greek gods, if you look at the Roman gods, if you look at the Mormon god, according to Mormon teaching, the god in heaven is only one of a multitude of gods, and he uh, is, uh, um, uh, once was a man like we are. That's what Mormonism teaches. And it tells every one of its followers that are male that they too can, uh, can ascend and become a god. 
course, what's funny is that's the same lie that Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He said, you shall be as gods. If you drink, if you eat this fruit, the Lord said, don't touch it. But the only reason he said that is because he knows if you do, you shall be as gods. That's the lie that Mormonism buys into, folks. So be careful when those good-looking fellas in their white shirts and ties come knocking on your door trying to share with you another testament of Jesus Christ. It's a lie. It's garbage. It's foolishness. Their God had a beginning. Their God had a start. The Jewish faith understands that God is, period. That God has always been, period. There is no start to God. He simply is. Amen. If you look at the names that are applied to God, God is a constant. Unlike many world religions which articulate the origins of their gods, the Jewish faith begins its record with the simple assumption and assertion that God was. The very name that we today uh, pronounce Jehovah means the self-existent one or the self-subsisting. By saying self-subsisting, you mean he requires nothing from anyone, anywhere to exist or to, subs to sustain his existence. Jehovah is the special and significant name, not merely an appellative title such as Lord, which is, uh, Lord is translated from the Hebrew word Adonai, by which God revealed himself unto the ancient Hebrews. So God revealed himself as Jehovah to the ancient Hebrews. This name, however, is a tetragrammaton, uh, of the Greeks, it was held by the later Jews to be so sacred that it was never pronounced except by the high priest on the great day of atonement when he entered into the most holy place. Whenever this name occurred in the sacred books, they pronounced it as they still do, Adonai. So the Jews do not pronounce this name. It is a, a tetragrammaton, which means it is a, a word that has no vowels. It only has the consonants. So therefore, you can't pronounce it. We call it Jehovah because somebody added some vowels in there to try to make it into a name and try to figure out what the name was. But listen, the Jews to this day use the term Adonai, which means Lord, thus using another word in its stead. So instead of trying to pronounce a name that's unpronounceable, because there's no vowels in it, they simply insert Adonai, which means Lord. The Masoretes gave to it the vowel points appropriate to this word. This Jewish practice was founded on a false interpretation of Leviticus 24.16. The meaning of the word appears from Exodus 3.14 to be the unchanging, eternal, self-existent God. The am that I am, a covenant-keeping God. The Hebrew name Jehovah is generally translated in the authorized version and the revised version has not departed from this rule by the word Lord. So in the, in the authorized translation, the King James translation, you see the word Lord. You will not see the word Jehovah. You'll see the word Lord printed in small capitals to distinguish it from the rendering of the Hebrew Adonai and the Greek Curious, which are also rendered Lord, but printed in the usual type. The Hebrew word is translated Jehovah only in Exodus 6 and 3, Psalm 83, 18, and Isaiah 12 and 2, as well as Isaiah 26 and 4, and in the compound names uh, mentioned below. 
Yahweh is a title that is a name that is ascribed to God. And the term Yahweh also means I am. Amen. So you see, the names that God has ascribed to Himself are names that speak simply of His eternal existence without beginning, without end. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Therefore, in Genesis, the Word of God begins with that assertion and that assumption. In the beginning, God. There, there's no description of how God came into being. There's no explanation of it because He didn't come into being. He was there. Hallelujah. So in the beginning, God simply was there. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Nothing was made without the Word of God. Jesus is called the Word of God because Jesus is the byproduct of God speaking. Amen. The term word that is used in John chapter 1 is the term logos, which simply means an expressed thought, a spoken plan, or a verbalized idea. So God spoke the Savior into existence before the world ever began. He already promised, He already expressed his plan for a Savior from the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Why do people get so hung up on this in Trinitarian circles? Why do they get so hung up on this notion that the Word is a separate person because they don't understand what Word, what Logos means? If you look at Isaiah 48 and 3, listen. God says, I have declared... The former things from the beginning. And they went forth out of my mouth. And I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. So what is God saying? God is saying, the creation process, here's what it took. I spoke, it happened. That I said it, it went out of my mouth. And how long did it say it took for those things to occur? He said it happened suddenly. It was immediate. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Uh -huh. When you look at, at Genesis chapter 1, verses 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, and 26, you see, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be a firmament firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Uh, verse number 9 And God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. Genesis 1 verse 11 And God said let, all, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after this his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. Verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moon moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. In verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Verse 26, And God said, 
Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. How difficult is it to understand today what John wrote in John chapter 1 verse uh, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word. What was John saying? John was saying simply this, in the beginning, God spoke. Everything that occurred in the beginning, everything that happened at the start, was the byproduct of what? God speaking. His speech, His word, His plan, His promise, His idea was spoken, and that promise, according to John chapter 1, became flesh and dwelt among us. That word. But who was that word? That word was God. Hallelujah. See, folks, i got news for you today. Jesus is God from A to Z. Hallelujah. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is God from A to Z. Isn't it interesting that King James translators use the term that Jesus Christ is, listen, the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes. The author, he wrote it, he planned it, he put it down, he spoke it into existence, and then he made it happen. Do you follow what I'm telling you? He is God from A to Z. Hallelujah. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Praise the name of the Lord. In Acts 17, verses 24 through 28, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. You remember I said earlier that the very name Jehovah or the very name Yahweh speaks of his self subsisting. He, he doesn't require anything from us. He doesn't require anything from anybody to exist. He is self-existing. Well, here in the book of Acts, this is what the Word of God tells us again. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him, and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. So he's saying God is not far from us at all. The only problem is a lot of people don't look for Him. But if you look for Him, you'll find out that everywhere you go and everything you do, God is there. Because God is not <coughs> confined to time or space. God is the Spirit. Therefore, the Word of God tells us that God, His very Spirit, gives life and breath to everything on this planet simply by our dwelling within that Spirit, just simply by our uh, moving about with that Spirit around us. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Amen. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also His offspring. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ declares in the New Testament, in John's revelation of the Christ, of Jesus, He declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the A to Z. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Yet in the Old Testament, we read the identical same words being spoken by what 
the Jewish reader would ascribe to Jehovah God, to Yahweh, to Adonai, the Lord. And is there a conflict? Is there a misunderstanding here? No, not at all. Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament, revealed to humanity in a physical form. The Apostle Paul said, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he says, God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. God was manifest in the flesh. Got news for you, friend. It wasn't the second person of the Holy Trinity that was manifest in the flesh. It was God who was manifest in the flesh. I keep telling you over and over again, go back to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us the child is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And in case there be any confusion as to which person of the Trinity... The Everlasting Father. The baby that was in the manger that we call Counselor. The baby in the manger that we call Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. He's all of those things. Why? Because honey got news for you. He is God from A to Z. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my word, is this hard to get today? Are you getting a little inspired in this? This is what I call good news. Amen. Anybody who's afraid of God should welcome this message today because if you look at Jesus, the Word of God said, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Read the Gospels. Read the four accounts of four men that we today call apostles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read their accounts of the life and the ministry of the man Jesus Christ. And understand today that that man was the physical manifestation of Almighty God. Honey, I want to tell you something. You read about Jesus in the gospel, you're going to find out you ain't got nothing to be afraid of. Amen. Hallelujah. He was love. Glory to God. The Word of God said God is love. Not simply that God loves, but that God is love. Hallelujah. And when you look at Jesus, honey, He was love, wasn't He? Amen. He could sit down with sinners and publicans. He could sit down with people that the religious men of His day eschewed. They despised. They looked down upon and thought of them as disgusting and dirty. And yet Jesus would sit down and eat with them. I want to tell you, in Middle Eastern culture, there is nothing more intimate than having a meal. Have you ever eaten at a place that serves food Middle Eastern style? Y'all dip from the same plate. You know, you use these little pieces of bread and you reach into the common plate and pull meat out of it. Uh, it's a very intimate experience to sit down and eat with somebody. And they, they didn't bring you a separate plate, Brother Johnny. At the Last Supper, they didn't have, you know, 12 plates for the apostles and the Lord. No, they... It all is served in one big fashion and everybody reaches out and just pulls from the common serving. So it's very intimate. Jesus would break bread and dine with people that the religious men of his day looked down on. Oh, honey, some people watching this today, some of us were saying, I I've been there, or I am there. People look down on me. People see me as dirty. They see me as unclean. Yeah, that's all right. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will answer and let me in, he said, I will come in, listen, and I will sup with them. Hallelujah. Johnny, it don't matter to me today if anybody thinks I'm saved, if anybody thinks I'm a Christian, if anybody thinks I'm ready for heaven. I got news for you today, honey. Jesus and I dine. Hallelujah. We have dinner together. We sup together. We have fellowship. We have communion. It doesn't matter to me how you think of me. That's right. Because my God is love. Yes, and he manifested himself 
in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, folks, you're seeing the nature of our God. Say, well, but the Bible tells us that God is going to execute wrath upon the wicked and the unbelieving. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. But you know what? It's just like a loving parent. You can see parents sometimes love their kids to death, spoil them rotten, treat them super. But when that kid really acts up and that kid really does something stupid and dumb, sometimes daddy take you in the room and say, Son, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. Uh, how many of us ever heard that saying at some point? Now, I know when I heard it, the person telling me was lying. I know. <laughs> but they tell you, say, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. The Word of God says, it is not God's will that any should perish but that all should come under repentance. God has no desire for anybody to wind up in the devil's hell. i got news for you. God is not interested in anybody being lost. But He has gone to immense lengths to carry out a complex plan that involved Himself coming to earth and revealing Himself as one of us. So that we could know Him, and not just know Him, but know Him intimately. Know Him personally. Right. You ever read a book, and you read so much about the main character, you felt like you knew Him? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we read certain books, and after a while you're like, Boy, I'll tell you what, that character, I, I just, you know, sometimes we'll compare them to somebody we know, and say, well, that person reminds me of this person, or... But we feel like we know that person simply from having read about them. This is why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were given the responsibility of recording their, from their standpoint, from their viewpoint, the life and ministry of Jesus. But you know what? You don't see a loving Christ in Matthew and a hateful Christ in Mark. You don't see a loving Jesus in Luke and a judgmental Jesus in John, do you? No. All four Gospels portray Him the same way. He's patient. He's loving. He's merciful. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's a healer. He's a help. Uh, he's there to encourage. When He had His meeting with the woman at the well, He could easily have said in judgment of her, She was a Samaritan. She'd had several husbands and now she was living with a man that she wasn't even committed to. He could easily have sat in judgment of her. But instead of sitting in judgment of her, what did he do? He said, listen, I'm the one that's been promised. Hallelujah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. She knew that the Christ was supposed to be coming. And he said, you're talking to him. Hallelujah. He never said one word of condemnation or judgment. When they dragged a woman out before him who had been caught in the very act of adultery. And according to the law of Moses, there had to be at least two or three physical witnesses to the act. So when they brought this woman out, they must surely have had two or three witnesses, uh, Bill. Because otherwise, the law would not have condemned her. But they told him, they said, the law says that she must be condemned because they had the witnesses. Apparently, this woman perhaps had been a little careless. Maybe she and her married lover were engaged in something sexual in a public place location that wasn't so hidden and somehow or another maybe you know in today's world we've got people that like to do things in public parks or in their cars and somebody happened upon them and having the required two or three witnesses she was according to the law of Moses condemned she stood condemned they dragged this woman before the Lord. And did the Lord say, well, the law says you're to be stoned, so bless God, let's start stoning her. No. No. He challenged those that were around her and said, well, let the man that is without sin cast the first stone. Let's start there. Let the first guy to be throw the first stone, let it be the one who is without sin. And you know, I've said many times, 
There was not one hypocrite in that bunch. You got to give that bunch of men credit. Right. Because there was not one hypocrite in the bunch. You could have had somebody step forward and say, Well, bless God, I know I'm without sin. Oh, if Jesus were here today and there were a homosexual standing in front of him and he uttered those words, Let he that is without sin cast the first stone, I'm sure Franklin Graham would step forward. Right. Hello now. I'm sure the members of First Holiness Church would stand forward. I'm sure folks from United Pentecostal Church over here, over there, would step forward. Because after all, my hair is so high, my sleeves are so long, my skirts are of a certain length. That makes me holy! Idiot. Amen. This is the face of our God, folks. Because that man Jesus was and is always will be the A to Z God. Hallelujah. He is God from start to finish. He is the Word. He is the Word that proceeded from God, that created all things. He is the Word that proceeded from God, a promise of a Messiah, the promise of a Savior. God said, I'm going to send a Savior. He said, I will be that Savior. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, God says over and over again, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no Savior. Only God can be our Savior. Only God. God alone is qualified because God alone is perfect. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, let me finish this message. Say, Pastor, you haven't preached for an hour and a half. You're really going to end this early? Yep. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Hallelujah. Jesus declares in the same words as Jehovah God from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Listen, and I will be his God. And he shall be my son. Father and the Son are not separate because that would make God the Father our grandfather. No. Jesus Christ is God from A to Z. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? 